coming up next on Passion Struck. Perfectionism can come in many different flavors. And actually, that's the most interesting thing about perfectionism. No real one size fits all. So one perfectionistic person is not the same as another because they will have different emphasis. Some people will be way more personally invested in their perfectionism. So that's to say they have an intense desire to be perfect and that need comes from within and they set excessively high goals themselves. They're quintessential overstrivers. And when they haven't met those goals, it can be very harshly self-critical. So this is what's called a self-oriented perfectionist person. This perfection comes from within. Welcome to Passion Struck. Hi, I'm your host, John R. Miles. And on the show, we decipher the secrets, tips, and guidance of the world's most inspiring people and turn their wisdom into practical advice for you and those around you. Our mission is to help you unlock the power of intentionality so that you can become the best version of yourself. If you're new to the show, I offer advice and answer listener questions on Fridays. We have long form interviews the rest of the week with guests ranging from astronauts to authors, CEOs, creators, innovators, scientists, military leaders, visionaries, and athletes. Now, let's go out there and become passion struck. I am so excited today to have Thomas Curran on Passion Struck. This is an episode I've wanted to bring to you for quite a long time. So I'm glad, Thomas, we can finally do it. Welcome. Thanks, John, for having me. I'm really excited to chat about perfectionism. Thomas, before we get into perfectionism, I was looking at your resume and I found out that before you were a professor at the London School of Economics, you actually worked for Goldman Sachs doing behavioral science research. And I always find it fascinating uh, because when I was at Lowe's and Dell, we had behavior scientists as well who were studying mm-hmm. more of the customer impact. But based on what I saw, it looked like you were doing work on internally what was happening at Goldman Sachs. And I was hoping you might be able to talk a little bit about it. Yeah, that's right. I've done a lot of work for firms like Goldman, trying to understand really what's happening in the workforce at the moment. There's a lot of turnover. People are brought on, cost a lot of money to bring them into the system and train them up and all the rest of it. And they're finding that having made that investment that there seems to be there for a short time and then they move and that's very costly so really retainment is a big problem right now in a lot of firms and the work that i've been doing in those areas trying to understand what makes employees tick what is it about cultures environments that allow them to thrive in those organizations and in, in so doing find work a happier place to be but also a place that's fulfilling that allows them to pursue their goals, allows them to feel a sense of competence and relatedness within the organization. And those things we know are really important in terms of their engagement at work and therefore their willingness to stay the course, so to speak. And so that's really a lot of the work that I've been doing in those areas, trying to basically do research projects, get a sense of the lay of the land and what it's like around here, and then try to pinpoint some of the areas where and there might be some dissatisfaction, where there might be a little bit of a lack of engagement or even disaffection or perhaps burnout in certain pockets of organizations and try to really fact find and then put in place some recommendations or strategies that can help those individuals feel more engaged and more motivated. So I think that's really the work that I've been doing. And I think that's why a lot of firms really are looking outward towards behavior science to try to understand not just the customer, and how they can market and create tools that engage and and bring revenue, but also how they look after their own staff and keep them happy, keep them productive, keep them vitalized and all the rest of it. So I think that's why firms um, like Goldman and others are turning towards behavior scientists. I'm always a little bit skeptical when I see some of the studies that come out from Gartner and from other groups, especially the one on engagement, because it's just hard for me to fathom if what they're saying is accurate, that out of a billion full-time workers across the entire planet, that over 70% of them are disengaged. But Mm. if that is true, what do you think from your research and being involved in a number of companies are one or two of the root causes that might be causing this disengagement? Oh, there's, it's so much, and it can vary from firm to firm. But I think broadly, the workplace has changed from what it used to be. 
a career was a thing that our parents knew extremely well, that they went into a firm or an organization, they mastered a skill in that particular organization, they worked their way up, became an authority in that area, maybe managed a team. And if they went even higher, they maybe sat on the board. And this was the traditional life course of a job. But today, it's not necessarily that straightforward. Lots of young people go into a very insecure job market at the moment. They will hop from job to job. This was something unheard of even one generation ago, but now normal, right? You jump from one job to the next job, to the next job, to the next job. And I think that does create that insecurity is on the one hand, quite liberating. It's not going to hustle and grind culture. I'm going to make something of myself, make my way. But on the other hand, it can be psychologically really difficult because we don't know where we are going to next year. There's always uncertainty about whether we're doing enough, whether we're working hard enough, whether we're sacrificing enough to please our boss or the organization, because we might be let go in six months, a year's time. And that insecurity and whilst at first can seem liberating i think over time can feel really draining especially if we don't feel we're getting anything or as much back as what we feel like we're putting in it can create a lot of cynicism and a little bit of resentment at times and looking over our shoulder what's the next opportunity could i have a better deal at this firm or that firm for me this kind of new work environment just creates this sense that we're never quite sure if we're enough, if we're good enough. And, and so that's what I think is at the root more generally of that big sort of these numbers that you're quoting here, this big sort of disaffection and disengagement numbers around the amount of sheer number of workers that feel like they're disengaged. I, I think it's a response to the new work climate, which is more insecure demands a lot. And outside of those big kind of narrow elite professions, doesn't feel to a lot of people like he's giving them enough back. Yes, I had a really interesting conversation with Seth Godin a couple uh, months ago. He has a new book out called The Song of Significance. He really feels that what is missing in so many of the work environments today is significance and how what you're doing at work relates to inner joy, inner contentment, et cetera. So between what you said and what he said, I think there's something there. And I have to tell you, I saw this firsthand when I was at a company called Lendlease which you may be familiar with because the parent company owns Bovis Lendlease, which is oh, a yeah. large construction company in London. Yep. Well, when I first joined them, they were this huge monstrosity of a company based out of Sydney, Australia, where they had been headquartered their entire existence. And at that time we owned the second largest bank in Australia. We owned real estate investment trust. We had large mutual funds, et cetera. And then this part of the business where we would do construction and construction management. And it was a beautiful model because they would use the investments from the financial side to feed the other side. But fast forward, the board decided to get rid of all the financial aspects of the company. And they brought in a CEO who had come from cable and wireless in the UK and really knew nothing about the business model. And I saw as he ended up making a couple of moves, one to go through the divestiture of all these financial services aspects of the company. And so when that happened, our PE ratio went from 40X down to 8X. But then he also made the decision to shift the headquarters from Australia to London. And so he delisted us from the Australian Stock Exchange and put us on European exchanges. And the issue that happened was that no one knew who Lendlease was and had no name recognition. And what I saw being an employee at that time and a fairly senior executive was just the complete culture shock that ended up happening and the mass accidents that happened globally. So mm -hmm. I think sometimes companies don't think through the cultural implications of this. And I think that's another reason why people lose sight of the impact that they're able to have in these companies. I think that ties in rather neatly with what your conversation with Seth was driving at. As an organization, there are so many moving parts. And if people within that organization feel like they are having a say or have input into big decisions, like huge decisions, that can feel like that there's a sense of indifference that the company holds towards the employee. And that indifference is really so important actually today 
Because if you look at the amount of churn and the extent to which everyone moving from the kind of traditional career path to more freelance, taking control and ownership over their own prospects and career, it's really tough. If you can be let go in six months, a year's time, the message that's sending out really is the company doesn't necessarily value you. If you want to look at the extreme end of that spectrum, it's that you're disposable. <laughs> so don't get too comfortable this is most crisis of significance this crisis of mattering people fundamentally want to matter a key character in my book gordon flat does a lot of work on perfectionism but he also is very keen to understand this crisis of mattering particularly among young people but i would argue we're seeing this a lot in the workplace too for the exactly the reasons of the story you told and the reasons that seth talks about so i do think it's such an important topic right now that not a lot of people are talking about but i think we need to grapple with because it's one of the keys to understanding what's happening in the world i think you're absolutely right so thank you for diving into that i want to now start going into perfectionism and i'm going to introduce it like this i remember when i was younger in my career perfectionism was almost billed as this magical thing that you wanted to attain when i was first preparing for job interviews after I left the military, you knew you were going to get that question, what is your greatest strength and what is your greatest weakness? And a lot of the things I was reading at the time were telling me to tell them that I'm a perfectionist and that's also my greatest strength, but it's also my greatest weakness. And people, and you start out the book by talking about Michelle Pfeiffer, but I remember seeing athletes talk about being perfectionists, leaders of companies talking about it, famous athletes talking about it, actors, actresses talking about it. So it's interesting to me that when I talk to behavioral scientists or psychologists, what initially gets them interested in going into these deep areas of studies they do. And so for you, what caused you to start looking at the study of the science of perfectionism? Well, for the reason, actually, you just described is everywhere. No matter where you look, perfection is not far around the corner, whether it's a billboard, whether it's a social media feed, whether it's a movie theater, sports event, whatever. Wherever we look, there's these idealized lives and lifestyles being lived out of the rich and famous or the uber successful. Because we live in a culture that lionizes the 1% or the 0.01%, the unicorn achiever. They're the people that are platformed. They're the people we speak to, we want to hear from. I certainly fell into that trap myself when I was working my way up the career ladder. I come from a small town, modest aspirations and all the rest of it. But I suddenly had myself propelled into a very, call it elite university, what we call Russell Group in the UK, similar to the Ivy League. And suddenly like that kind of clash just really exploded, created a lot of difficulty, put self-imposed pressure, seeing everyone else who was so good, so intelligent, so smart, working so hard, doing so much better than I was. And all of that kind of just, I guess you call it a pressure cooker environment of being in this really hyper-competitive context culminated in some really quite significant difficulties in terms of my own mental health, worries about how I'm doing, inability to feel satisfied with any achievement, irritability, struggle sleeping, low mood, all of the classic symptoms really of what you would want to look back now and see as depression were there. And all of them driven in no small part by that incessant need to excel and do better and be perfect at all times. And of course, once I was able to seek help for those feelings and was brought to the realization that it was perfectionism that was actually creating the problems rather than something that was holding me up, something that was keeping me moving, something that was making me successful, was really when I began to think, okay, so this is something that we need to be thinking about more critically in modern culture. So I looked into literature, couldn't find a great deal and haven't been an academic of what you want. Let's do some work in this area. Let's try and understand what's going on. And one of the first things that the, the, the reason I'm even talking to you, the way the reason my research is brought to prominence, because I was the first research to really take a look at this over time and to try to understand what's happening to young people and how they're becoming more perfectionistic. And we're finding in our data time and time again that young people are reporting far higher levels of perfectionism than they did in the past. And those levels are growing. So it was really research in this respect was me search. It was very much a personal interest, but I hope I've been able to shine a more critical light, shall we say, on perfection. Well, speaking of your research and the length of time that you've been doing this, I happened to read uh, one of your research papers from 2017 on perfectionism. 
And in there, it had an, an interesting element that I really hadn't thought about. And that is the difference in how perfectionism impacts us when we're directing it towards the self versus when perceived to come from others. Can you discuss what the difference is and how it manifests itself differently? Perfectionism can come in many different flavors. And actually, that's the most interesting thing about perfectionism. There's no real one size fits all. So one perfectionistic person is not the same as another because they will have different emphasis. Some people will be way more personally invested in their perfectionism. So that's to say they have an intense desire to be perfect and that need comes from within and they set excessively high goals for themselves. They're quintessential overstrivers. And when they haven't met those goals, it can be very harshly self-critical. So this is what's called a self-oriented perfectionist person. The perfection comes from within. But in many clinical interactions and talking to perfectionists and people and doing a lot of research in this area over many decades, researchers have discovered that actually perfectionism is way more than just a personal obsession. It's also something that comes from the social world. And in fact, in many ways, it is a relational trait. It's an intently relational trait because why are we setting those high goals for ourselves? It's to gain the validation and approval of other people, to tell us that we matter, going back to mattering, to tell us that we are worth something in this world. Because without that approval, we feel that we don't have a sense of self. It's, it's so important for us to feel like connected through perfect performances, perfect appearances. And that social element is really important because it also means that perfectionism isn't just something that comes from a video, it's something that we feel comes from outside of us too. There's an intent feeling that everyone and all around us expects us to be perfect at all times and they're waiting to pounce when we're not perfect. This is called socially prescribed perfectionism. And actually there's a third element, this perfectionism that's turned outward onto others. So this is a perfectionism that I'm... I need to be perfect and I'm pouring myself over hot coals to be perfect. So you're going to do that too, because that's only fair, right? This is good other oriented perfectionism. And these three elements of perfectionism are really what we understand to be a broad understanding of what's called a multidimensional perfectionism. And as I say, people can score higher or lower on each of these spectrums. Some can be high on self, a little bit lower on social, and maybe in the middle of other and all sorts of other different combinations. And that's, and that's why perfectionism could come in all sorts of different sizes. But it's really important when we talk about perfectionism that we do recognize that social element because without it, we get a very incomplete understanding of what perfectionism is, what it does to us, and why it can be so damaging. One of the things I often talk about on this podcast is how we today are so caught up in emulating ourselves against the extrinsic aspects of success, things like money, status. And we think we're living the quote unquote good life but I think it's just going down the continual rat race to the bottom when we're doing that. But it seems like that obsession with having to appear as if we've achieved this success on the outside is a powerful driving force for this obsession with being perfect. Can you discuss that a little, in a little bit more detail? Yeah, absolutely. We started the conversation, didn't we, with a discussion or analysis about how perfectionism is lionized in modern society there's a very definitive shift that's taken place over the last 20 30 years in the post-war period you had this idea of the affluent society the celebrated member of society is really the average joe you think the flintstones you think the jets and average families a nice house in the suburbs car a couple of kids this was like what we celebrated it was the average joe that was the american hero today we have a complete shift and the average individual is really not the person that we celebrate. In fact, if anything, average is a decidedly dirty word these days, partly because the middle classes are being hollowed out as we speak, but also because what we've decided to do is fix our gaze instead on, as I mentioned, the 0.01%, the people who have made it to the extreme top because they're the people we want to emulate. That's what we think we should be shooting for. Nassim Taleb did a really interesting analysis. He used the example of sport, but it can be applied to other contexts. If you want to make it into that elite, then you're going to have to be a Six Sigma individual. That's to say one in 1.4 million people, right? That is improbable, not impossible, but completely improbable for most people. And actually the reality is that about 70% of us on a normal curve, bell curve, are going to be somewhere around the average, one standard deviation, either side of the average. And there really shouldn't be any shame in that. But right now, because of the way we celebrate these possible ideals, there is a shame 
in being where most of us uh, reside. And I think that then pushes us to point our <laughs> compass in the direction of things that are so excessive. Our expectations are so warped that we're just going to continually feel that we're not enough, that we haven't done enough we haven't got enough we aren't productive enough that is never going to end because the end point that we hold in our mind's eye is so impossible that we're only going to ever be disappointed and not only that but even if our talents and efforts take us to the top we are still going to be disappointed because this kind of mindset of ever more this perfectionistic mindset of never enough well, it just exposes our dreams as nothing more than dead ends. And some of the most unhappy people are some of the people that have actually made it to that bracket. But they just can't settle there. They can't be content because there has to be more. There has to be more. There has to be more all the time. And as I said, that, that's the treadmill that we're all on. I think that's what's infecting us with this perfectionism. And I think if you look at the mental health crisis that we're experiencing, the crisis of, of despair that we're seeing, particularly among young people, I think a lot of that the variance in those crises can be explained by these warped standards and expectations that we just project into people's lives 24 7 these days it's interesting i released episode today with arthur brooks and we spent a lot of time about discussing the hedonic treadmill which is something that is studied by behavior scientists greatly but it's interesting because he recently wrote a book called build the life you want with uh, none other than oprah winfrey and in your book you started out by talking about a famous interview that Oprah Winfrey did. And this happened to be with Lance Armstrong. And the reason I'm bringing this up is I think it ties directly into what you were just describing. We see people out there, famous athletes. It could be Messi. It could be Steph Curry here in the United States. And you hear about how much training they do to perfect the way that they play. Lance Armstrong is an interesting case because if you think about it, no one has done seven de France victories like he did, which was just amazing when he accomplished it. But how has this become an example of how we measure our behavior to stay within the bandwidth of what's socially acceptable or normal? So first of all, this was a, just an interview that always stayed with me. This is an interview with Oprah Winfrey and Lance Armstrong quite a few years back now, but most people, most of your listeners will remember it because it was the interview where Lance Armstrong was in, invited to admit publicly that he'd won those Tour de France titles with the assistance of performance in hearts and drugs. And of course it was a big scandal at the time. But one of the things that really stayed with me about the interview was Lance's explanation, which was essentially along the lines of what everyone else was doing. And this is true. This is what you mean. Look at the Peloton back then, everybody else was using EPO to enhance performance. And what that means is essentially what you have is this kind of bizarre scenario that unfolded at that time in cycling, where because everybody else was doping, it meant that anyone coming into the sport had to dope too. And so basically it wiped out any advantage that you had to the doping because everyone was doing it, right? Now it was making no one cyclist any more likely to win. But of course you had this, these health complications and all the rest of it that made the sport extremely dangerous in those times for no added advantage. Like if everyone decided one year to just everybody stop, then you would, then you'd have exactly the same competition. And this was a really interesting explanation to me. And it said something I think quite profound about actually modern society and how, if all you see all around you is people pursuing these unattainable perfectionistic standards and goals, then even though that's absurd, even though that's unhealthy, our instinct is to go with it. Because living inside a culture, we are so consumed and surrounded by that culture that we cannot see the absurdities. It's only when we take a step back and we look closer and we interrogate whether actually is what we're doing today healthy? Is it making us happy? Is it providing us with fulfillment and contentment? And we can answer those questions, I think, with a resounding no. If we look at the hedonistic hamster wheel that you talk about, this kind of incessant need to do and have more it isn't healthy but we can't escape it because everyone else is doing it and i think that's that was a really interesting interview and it really it was a bit of an epiphany moment for me when i was trying to unpack what's going on in wider culture around perfectionism because i think the parallels were very interesting and i think that that was an interesting microcosm of what's of a broader problem if that makes sense 
It does. And for the U.S. listeners, it's very akin to what happened here in Major League Baseball during the era that Barry Bonds and others played in it. And when you talk to some of those professional athletes, they all say from the moment they entered the minor leagues, everyone was using performance enhancing drugs. And so if you wanted to compete at all, you were forced to do it. But it's the same thing that you brought up in cycling. All of a sudden you have everyone doing it. So <laughs> yes. <laughs> Well, Thomas, one of the things I've always wondered about perfectionism, and I'm hoping from your research you can talk more into this, is perfectionism something that we're born with, or is it something that we cultivate throughout our life? Yeah, it's a really good question. Actually, we're talking a lot about cultural factors, things going on in wider society and in the economy that weigh on our need to be perfect. But if you actually look at the data, you'll find that there's a very heavy genetic influence on perfectionistic tendencies and perfectionistic thoughts and behaviors, about 30, 40% between person difference between people in levels of perfectionism can be explained by genetics. Now, that's actually quite consistent with what most personality research tells us about people's general dispositions and tendencies up to around 50% actually of the way we turn out is predetermined, so to speak, out of our control, can't do anything about it, just the way we're born. But that does leave a lot for the environment to explain. So while that's still a lot, about half and perfection, a little bit less, 30, 40%, you're still looking at, at the majority of a perfectionism being explained between perfectionism and being explained by environmental factors. So there's still quite a lot for the environment to explain. And that's why my book and my perspective on perfectionism really takes a, a deep dive into the cultural societal factors that are weighing on the need to be perfect. But it is important for listeners to be aware that there is also a heavy heritability factor here. And if your parents are perfectionistic and you're perfectionistic, well, that probably isn't a coincidence. It's probably because you're born with some predisposition to carry those tendencies forward into your life. I first learned about a concept called effortless perfection about 18 months ago when I did an interview with Susan Kane, and it came up because she was doing a lot of research on college campuses about her book from last year, Bittersweet. Mm -hmm. And she said when she went to Princeton, she started hearing primarily from female students this concept of effortless perfection that has absorbed their lives from the time they were in high school to now being in an Ivy League. And the way she described it to me was that people feel that in order to get into the Ivy League or your equivalent in the United Kingdom, that they have to not only have perfect grades, they have to get perfect boards to get into the school, but now mm -hmm. they have to have extracurricular activities that showcase it. They have to have volunteer hours that showcase it. And so all of a sudden you're trying to emulate this standard that I think society has set for trying to achieve going to these schools that people aspire to do. Mm -hmm. And what I wanted to ask is how do the social connections that shape our formative experiences such as this when we're adolescents impact perfectionism in our lives? Oh, tremendously. You know what I feel for young people today, because there is just so much pressure out there to excel. And it's not pressure that is kind of blown up in their own minds. It's real pressure. You have to do well at school. There's no alternative. This is your one shot to get into the best classes, which mean that you get entered into the best assessments, which mean you've got the best shot of getting into the best colleges, which are the only ticket to the elite professions, right? The ones that actually have wages growing year on year, things like tech, medicine, law, finance, and all those sorts of things. Now that's a very narrow set of professions and only a very small percentage of young people will make it. But nevertheless, this is what we're setting up at the very beginning for young people to attain and again it goes back to what we were saying about these warped expectations the sense that everybody can be in the one percent ignoring the logical fallacy that there can only be a one percent right and most people by the way ain't, ain't gonna make it now that's not the, this isn't to say you should dampen your ambition and all the rest of it but it's just to say that this these expectations that we're putting on young people are, are excessive they're relentless and i feel sorry for parents i feel sorry for young people i feel sorry for schools i feel sorry uh, yeah have a certain amount of sympathy for the elite education institutions too, but I do think they could be doing more to, to dampen this fire a little bit. 
but the whole system really is, is wrapped in the sense that everybody has to excel everybody has to achieve excessively high standards and young people internalize that of course they need to be perfect of course they do but also like you mentioned this kind of curious psychology where there is a need to be effortlessly perfect that's to say to show on the surface that we're absolutely smashing it that this isn't difficult that we're taking these challenges in our stride and we're moving serenely over the water whilst underneath the reality, and we know the reality is relentless amount of self-imposed pressure, late nights, worries about how we're doing. And I've seen students so worried about how they're doing that they won't even open their grade books. Like they won't open what they're grade because they think that one bad mark is going to ruin their future chances. Like the catastrophization around setback and difficulty is so fierce among young people now because they're told from day one, you can't fail. You know, your bad grade is going to move you backwards and you need to keep doing, you need to keep going, you need to keep doing better. Holding them almost on tiptoes all the time. I just feel for them because I think that pressure is crushing. It's in many cases overwhelming and I see students come through my door. The university have made it through that very brutal selection process. And they are in it bound with tension. And it's really I have to work so, so hard to relieve it, to take it off, to deflate it. And yeah, it, again, it, it, but it goes back to what we were saying earlier about the expectations in society. It's not just consumer culture, materialism, head and like treadmill. It's expectations to do well in school and college, to make something of ourselves in the world. And so, yeah, it's a real big problem right now for young people and i i write about some solutions in the book but i think the biggest one really is I try to if we can as a society build what's called a broad-based meritocracy a meritocracy that allows all people to flourish and pursue their own passions and interests that are true to themselves and and, and society that allows them to do that doesn't funnel them into a very narrow set of professions where only that those professions will allow them access to the good life or stability or security or whatever but actually every, every each and every child has their own skills has their own abilities has their own interests and passions and it's really important that we try to create a society and an education system that allows them to one identify those skills and passions and to pursue them and make meaningful contributions to societies that, that align with their skills and i just don't think we live in that world right now but that's i think t- relieving the pressure it certainly would be helped by a more caring and compassionate education system. I'm glad you brought up the testing. Here in the States, we have the SAT. I understand in England, the test that you take, as you were just explaining, there's immense pressure because it really dictates what school you go into. And I also spent a lot of time working and traveling in India. And I remember talking to a few of my friends who back in the day were trying to get into the top engineering programs in India. And they told me that there was so much pressure put on them by their families to do well on these tests that you would almost be an outcast if you didn't perform well on them. And it's interesting because I think when, whether you call it perfectionism or this overachievement culture that we have, I think a lot of it gets ingrained from our parents and the expectations that they place on us, even so much that if our parents feel like they don't matter, they're going to pass that on to us. But also if our parents are perfectionists, they're going to pass that on to us as well. And what I found Mm -hmm. interesting is you conducted a multi-generational study of perfectionism. Can you elaborate on some of the key findings and maybe any general differences or trends that you observed? I think it's really important to say up front when we're discussing parenting that just I've got so much empathy for, for parents because this is a really difficult society to know like what's best. If you allow your kids to kind of cruise in this world, take their foot off the accelerator or whatever, then that could have really profound consequences downstream for their life chances. Because as I say, we live in an economy that really, unless you're, there is no meritocracy right now for teachers, police officers firefighters people in who in solidly middle class professions just a generation ago right there's no meritocracy but they have seen no increase in living standards in fact they've just seen their wages shrinking in the context of inflation year on year while the elite professions sail away in terms of their remuneration so if you're a parent looking out into that world and your son or daughter has expresses an interest to be a teacher or whatever or a nurse is that something that you're going to be pushing towards or is it, or is it a conversation? Well, maybe this, but maybe it might be 
if they're showing a talent for maths or whatever or engineering maybe it might be that you go into this profession or that profession and so and, and i completely understand it because it's so tough to know what's best because society pushes us into making decisions that perhaps aren't ours and so the intense pressure on not just young people but parents is so fierce so i have so much empathy because it's really difficult to know what to do what to do for the best but what i would say is that our research shows a couple of things that you can bear in mind when it comes to parents these are broad philosophical ideas they're not any hard and fast specific strategies the first one really is to bear in mind that what young people really need is unconditional approval and that's consistency of approval and love for example if they come home from school and they've got an a grade and they've done really well they're really happy celebrate that give them a hug tell them how hard they've worked and praise that effort and show them that you're really proud of them but equally at the same time if they've come back home and they haven't done quite as well as they expected to they will be disappointed clearly that's just inevitable but show them the same amount of love and affection be be consistent with that approval at all times tell them it's just one grade of many different grades that you're going to get it's a learning opportunity it's not an indictment on you it doesn't say anything about how much you matter to your teacher or your parents or whatever this is just one solitary grade of many of others and so that consistency of love and approval is, is really important and also try and be aware of your own perfectionism and your own aversion to mistakes if you find that you're the sort of person that really worries about screwing up or find challenging situations really stressful, young people are going to pick up on that. They'll see that and they'll learn that mistakes, setbacks, challenges, things to be feared. And again, it's really important that you be open about failure, be open about setbacks. When you've screwed up, just talk about it with your family. Have an open channel line of communication to what well, today was a bad day. Did a presentation, didn't go down very well. The pitch was not very well received. I didn't get the sale. Whatever it is, talk to your children about these things because they really do show young people that actually failure isn't humiliating. It's just very humanizing. It's ha It happens and it's a learning opportunity and we move on. So lead by example and unconditional approval, I think are the main things to bear in mind um, when it comes to parenting these days. But as I say, the most important thing to recognize is that this is a really tough uh, environment to bring up kids these days and, and each and every one of you is doing an amazing job. Okay, thank you for that, Thomas. And I wanted to cover a couple specific things as it relates to perfectionism. The first would be social media. And I was wondering how much does social media play a significant role in shaping our perception of perfection? Yeah, social media for sure. There's socially prescribed perfectionism in our data seems to really take off around 2007, which was happened to be the time that I, Apple released the iPhone. And the social media platforms became mobile in, in our lives 24 seven. So there's certainly a consequential evidence that potentially there's a link between those social media platforms, smartphones and perfectionism, not causal, but I would say there's strong grounds to suggest that what we're seeing in social media being beamed into our lives, those perfect images of lives and lifestyles of the 1.1%, 0.1%, I think are impacting on our sense of what's normal what it should be expected, what we should be shooting for, what's what's obtainable and all the rest of it. And certainly I think that's being internalized, particularly among young people as a need to be perfect. But I would also say on social media, that doesn't necessarily mean you should throw the baby out of the bathwater. I think there's something remarkably positive about social media in its original incarnation. I say bringing people together around shared interests, sharing valuable information, cementing offline relationships, right? Bringing a forum to bring people together offline. All these social media can do all of these things. It's just the imperative right now is to capture our attention and spending through those platforms, which means by their nature now, they're very addictive and they, and they try to keep us online as much as they possibly can. And I think that's the issue right now. But at the same time, there is something I think we can hold on to as social media. Yeah, I, I think it's definitely driving some of the perfectionism, rising perfectionism, but I also think it has tremendous power to be very positive. And I was also hoping you could discuss the relationship between procrastination and perfectionism. Yeah, so perfectionistic people, extremely failure averse, as we talked about. They worry a lot about how they look, how they appear, how they're doing relative to other people. And that creates an interesting psychology. And one of the things that's baffled researchers, certainly baffled me, was when you look at the data, 
perfectionism has a very weak relationship with performance. You'd think that these people would be really high achievers, but actually it doesn't seem to be borne out in the evidence. And the reason for that is twofold. One, they work unsustainably hard, so they burn out. But the second reason is linked to procrastination, which you, which is the question you've asked. And what perfectionists do is really interesting when it comes to trying to push themselves forward to achieve goals is that on the first attempt, whenever they do something and they feel like they've got a baseline level of confidence, they will put everything forward to try to achieve the goal. That's where that high striving is comes out. But the moment they encounter setback, difficulty, challenge, or failure, this is when things get interesting. So when we put people in the lab and we expose them to some kind of failure, and then we ask them to do the activity again or the task again, non-perfectionistic people they don't really change the effort on the second attempt they just keep going but perfectionistic people do something really different they withhold their effort right they just avoid because the guilt the shame that they felt from that failure was so intense they don't want to feel that again so they just completely take themselves away from it right now that's avoidance procrastination is linked to this psychology because it's similar in the sense that burden or the cognitive strain of trying to do something really difficult is so intense the feelings of worry and apprehension are so intense that they just don't want to feel those things so they take themselves out so they procrastinate they do something else to distract themselves and of course that avoidance that procrastination is really anxiety management technique it's not really i think we think about procrastination as a time management problem it's not really it's an anxiety management problem we're trying to manage anxiety and worry about failing through distraction and what that means is that perfectionistic people really struggle to perform in the long term because they yes they put effort forward at the very beginning but when things get challenging they start to hold and this is procrastination avoidance is one of the reasons why perfectionism isn't very strongly correlated in performance contrary to popular belief and it's and it's essentially because perfectionistic people are sabotaging their chances of success to avoid that failure so there's a really interesting link there between perfection and procrastination okay and i have just two final questions for you in the third component of your book, you really advocate for embracing imperfection and trying to move away from the perfection trap that we're consumed with. Can you provide some practical tips for the listeners or strategies to let go of the need for perfection and find contentment in good enough? Yeah, I can give you a couple of things that have helped me in my life. And I know that there's a lot of evidence to support their efficacy. The first is really to break through that perfectionistic block or self-sabotage that we talked about just now when it comes to procrastination. Perfectionistic people will find it really difficult to let things go. They'll find it very difficult to put themselves into situations where they're quite likely to be judged, perhaps critically. So I'm thinking here, if we don't feel like we're a very good speaker, we won't put our hand up to do a talk. If we doubt our abilities to write very well, we might not put ourselves up to write projects or presentation slides or whatever. It might be that we feel uncomfortable in group settings, so we won't put ourselves forward to chair a meeting. It might be that we worry about how our performances are going to be appraised, so we don't put ourselves up for that promotion. <laughs> there are all sorts of fears that come with perfectionism that hold people back. The biggest thing you can do is make a commitment to yourself today to put things into the world, to let it go when it's good enough. It doesn't have to be perfect. That presentation that you're writing, there are hundreds of ways that, that presentation is going to land positively, but there is no perfect way. So accepting that when something is good enough, it's good enough is really important and put it out into the world. The writing the book was very therapeutic for me in that respect because I couldn't let it go. I wanted it to be bulletproof. And then I did let it go. And then I did get some bad feedback and it was okay. <laughs> it wasn't as catastrophic as I thought it was going to be. And that's the learning process of putting yourself out there, putting something into the world and just letting it sit there. Because often it's the case, in fact, every time it's the case, that catastrophe you've built up in your mind about how it's going to be perceived is really not what you think it is. So definitely this idea, feel the fear, do it anyway, is so important. So make a commitment to yourself today, tomorrow, if you've got something important that you're sitting on, that you're differing on, that you're worrying about, just get it out there, get it out there and move forward, keep going. And the second thing I would say is you, you got to try to work on those difficult feelings that come from failure and setback and challenge. Because if you're going to put stuff out there, if you're going to make a commitment yourself to put stuff out there, then things are going to go wrong. And perhaps you're going to be criticized. And perhaps there's going to be times when your presentation didn't land and you didn't get the sale. Self-compassion is now so important in that context. Because if you are going to put yourself out there, you're going to have to make a commitment also to be kind to yourself. 
And so self-compassion has got a lot of evidence in support of its efficacy. And self-compassion is really about reflecting on your common humanity. That's your common imperfect humanity. Realizing that nobody is perfect, can never be made perfect, going to make mistakes, going to slip up. Things are going to happen to us that are outside of our control that create real difficulties in terms of our health and happiness. And as a consequence, we need to be kind anytime those things come into our lives. Pat ourselves on the back, tell ourselves it's okay remind ourselves at all times that this is part of a bigger picture of a learning process and it's okay uh, to slip up and hit setbacks and finally i would say reframe 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 perfectionists are people who think a lot in very black and white terms they think that they have to do things must be done got to be done tomorrow and next week whatever and i think sometimes it's important to reflect on those feelings write them down ask ourselves is it a have to or is it would like to and what are our priorities here what actually needs to get done tomorrow and what can we put off or even what can we take off the to-do list give ourselves permission to not do as much as perhaps we feel like we should so it's self-reflection writing down our thoughts and reframing them into softer kinder ways and, and, and realistic ways to move forward those are the things i'd recommend okay and we started this whole interview out by talking about the lack of significance or mattering that so many people feel today. And today we've talked a lot about why self introspection is so vital to escaping this perfection trap. What are your hopes for the future regarding the discourse and awareness surrounding perfectionism? And how do you hope the perfection trap will help people to live a more balanced and healthier life and not strive so much for excellence? That's a good question. I think it's twofold. I think we do have a responsibility as individuals to recognize that we live inside this world, that actually these feelings are normal, natural response to what is sometimes quite relentless social conditioning in terms of you have to look a certain way, behave a certain way, perform a certain way, be have X amount of productivity in the rest of it. These societal messages that are bombarded with all the time. So I think the first thing is to recognize that and to decide on a different path, a path that isn't necessarily focused on perfecting, on excelling, but or just on meaning and purpose and pursuing our own interests and passions and not caring if we're not very good or if we're finding it tough. Because if anything we do from scratch, right, we're not going to be very good. We're going to suck at it. And that's just normal. It's natural. But doing it anyway, because it gives us joy. It gives us meaning. It gives us purpose. It's just pushing ourselves out of our, our comfort zone a little bit and pursuing interests and, and passions that are truly ours. I think that's something I'd really recommend because that really is like taking a sledgehammer to perfectionism. It's really a case of knowing that, that there is, I have my own personal path and that's what gives me joy and contentment rather than trying to follow all times, interests and activities and aspirations that aren't truly ours. So I think that intrinsic motivation is uh, really important. But also as a society, we also have to live in a culture and society that allows us to do that too, that recognizes that not everybody's going to be uh, a stockbroker. <laughs> and that actually there's value in teachers and nurses and police officers and firefighters and people who do incredible and plumbers and electricians people that do incredibly socially useful activities that align with their skill set and their passions and that they should be rewarded too that they should be remunerated fairly too that they should have the uh, permission to live a good enough life with with dignity and and purpose that actually there's value in all of us and all of and whatever we choose to do hopefully that aligns of our interests that we live in a society that allows us to do that and our contributions to society, whatever they may be to be recognized. So I think those are my two like main closing messages. Okay. And Thomas, for the listener who wants to learn more about you, I will obviously have many links to the book in the show notes, but where is a central place that they can do? I would say if you want to know more, just type into your Google Sir Thomas Curran, The Perfection Trap. That's where my book will come up and information about me will come up. And uh, yeah, please do. If you're intrigued, buy, buy a copy, give it a read. And uh, if you do, I'd love to hear from uh, you. Please do feel free to reach out. Tell me what you think of it. I love to hear from readers. So yeah, that's where you can find me. Well, Thomas, thank you so much for being here today and congratulations on some of the endorsements that you got for this great book from Adam Grant and my friend, Dan Pink. It's been such an honor to have you on the show. Thank you, John. It's been a pleasure. 
I thoroughly enjoyed that interview with Thomas Gran, and I want to thank Thomas, Scribner Press, and Brooke Craven for the honor and privilege of having them appear on today's show. You're about to hear a preview of the Passion Struck podcast interview I did with Dr. Vanessa Bonds, who's a social psychologist and professor of organizational behavior at Cornell University's ILR School. Dr. Bonds is the author of the eye-opening book, You Have More Influence Than You Think, where she draws from her original research to shed light on the powerful dynamics, consent, and influence. A lot of the studies I talk about in the book are about these social comparisons we do where we fall short. A lot of psychology is about overconfidence and how we take risks we shouldn't because we think that we'll surely be able to beat the lottery and make these things happen and that we're better at doing these calculations than other people. But when it comes to these sort of social contexts, it turns out that we wind up comparing ourselves to these people who are the absolute most social people you could imagine. Remember that we rise by lifting others, so share this show with those that you love and care about. And if you found today's episode useful on perfectionism, then definitely share it with someone who can use the advice that Thomas and I gave on today's show. In the meantime, do your best to apply what you hear on the show so that you can live what you listen. Now, go out there and become passion struck.